You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop, my bookshop, one of the last independent bookstores in the area, although I never understood what a dependent bookstore is. Um, today, we're happy to have with us Gary Steingart, I knew I would do that. Steingart, author of Little Failure, uh, published in January. Gary has uh, uh, also written Absurdistan, The Russian Debutante's Handbook, and Super Sad Love Story. His essays and short fiction have appeared in The New Yorker, The Times, Esquire, and a bunch of other sophisticated and impressive periodicals, and he's won a bunch of awards, too. So, Little Failure is a memoir, a book that contains, besides its actual content, um, you know, flavors of anger, angst, anxiety, fear, inadequacy, self-deprecation, failure, um, all traits that a good Jewish boy like me, um, but it started in a cauldron of, welcome, Gary, how are you? Thanks for being here. Good. So, Great to be here. I, I'm happy that you got the anger, angst, and anxiety, the, the triple A of Jewish literature. I can't help it, you know. It just comes out of me. Well, okay. yeah, but I said it was stirred in a cauldron or something, but I didn't know what word it's stirred, what it's stirred in. It's got to be stirred. Let's just call it cabbage soup. And, okay, yeah. well, you use a lot. Of, that's the other thing. You use There's food floating around your entire book. Yes. Wh what's farmer's cheese? I don't even know what farmer's cheese is. Farmer's cheese in Russian, it's called dvorak, is, uh, is a staple of Russian cuisine. Uh, my parents fed it to me for supper, and it's a kind of very dense version of cottage cheese. And the idea, I think, was that uh, because I would eat all this dvorak, I would grow to be incredibly tall because of all the height properties contained in dvorak. I am uh, five foot six on a good day, so it's another wonderful example of uh, things gone awry. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of rye, there was also a lot of rye bread in my life. But. Yeah, there's a lot of rye bread, there's a lot of butter, there's a lot of... Why the hell is there all this ham? You're not supposed to be eating ham. I mean, we had pork yeah. chops when we were little, but why did you have ham? In the Soviet Union, Jews were like everyone else. We ate, ham. We ate what was out there in the stores, or actually what was missing in the stores, but that happened to be tons and tons of ham products, you know, like most Eastern European countries. Russia is awash in ham, float in ham. <laughs> And lard. Lots of lard. And lard. I love lard. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because my father used to tell me these stories. He would make up these stories called Planet of the Yids, uh, in which a Jewish planet uh, was constantly bombarded by torpedoes of lard launched by uh, its uh, Slavic uh, enemies. And there was a Captain Nathan Sharansky, the famous dissident, who would defend the planet from the lard torpedoes. So that's sort of how I grew up with, with that kind of mythology. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because, <clears throat> you know, I want to I want to do like you. Oh, like like in your trailer, which is hilarious. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, and you look so incredibly woebegone. How did you get all those people in there? Uh, like, well, um, let's see, James Franco was a former student of mine at Columbia. So, really? Yeah. And he's a wonderful, wonderful writer and wonderful student. So making out with him on camera came pretty easily. Uh, Rashida Jones we reached out to. She actually, I think, likes my work, and I love her work, so that worked out great. Uh, Jonathan Franzen I know, and he played a wonderful psychiatrist. And Alex Karpovsky from Girls is a, fa a fellow Russian-American like me, so it was wonderful to get him to play a, a part in it, too. It's so interesting how um, trailers, kind of like trailers, have become, become almost ubiquitous in terms of bringing out new books. But they're, they're lots of fun, and usually they're really good. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, nobody really wants to read books anymore, but if you make a film about a book, people might get a little bit interested. Yeah, a few minutes ago I was just talking to um, uh, the guy who wrote Miss uh, Peregrine's School for Peculiar uh, Children, and uh, Ransom Riggs, and he has a great three trailers about the new book called The Hollow City, which just came out. But you don't want to talk about other people's books. Not at all. I'm not interested at all. I no, they're meaningless. But me, myself. Oh, God, <laughs> But I will say this, though. Yesterday, I interviewed Laura Vapnyar, who knows you. And, oh, yes. and she came out with The Scent of Pine, and um, she was talking. She goes, I hate that title. I said, well, what the hell did you name it that for? She goes, well, I was going to name it Anatomy of a Hedgehog. But, yeah. but I said, she goes, I thought the vivisectionist would be mad at me. I said, well, she says, I Google Scent of Pine and Lysol comes up. Right. <laughs> so I don't know why she yeah. named it that. 
I, I, well, I hope they cross-brand that book with, with Pineville. Uh, but Anatomy of a Hedgehog is a great title. My God, I would love to steal that title. She really came up with a good one there. Uh, you can have it, I guess. She's not going to use I it. Yes. Which reminded me when I, because the book is The Scent of Pine, and, which is a nice segue into the fact that, you know, the book is also about, and just like you were saying about the story with your father and how wonderful and, and maybe sometimes not wonderful he was, but, you know, when you talk about The Scent of Pine, you talk about the piney scent when you and he are running through that copse of spruce trees right, right. Um, by Lenin's Latin <laughs> flamingo-like statue. And so the book, you know, in addition to, you know, like if we both make fun of it or like the trailer makes fun of it, it's also really filled with a lot of love, hate, memory, growth, happiness. And, um, y you know, it's, it's not, it's not um, a book that's just designed to make fun of you or make fun of growing up Jewish. No, no. And I started out the book, you know, filled with a kind of, lack of understanding of my parents and maybe even a little bit of rage buried beneath that but i ended it with a feeling of of love and also a kind of sorrow the sorrow that their lives were so difficult and that that the lives of the people who gave birth to them were so difficult i mean you know it's just uh we didn't luck out in terms of places to be born uh, a russia that was ruled by stalin and invaded by hitler is not the best place to uh, grow up plus your ancestry all the people who died for no reason at all. How did you get? How did you get back so far in your ancestry? Did you? Well, my parents were nice enough to actually talk to me about it. Uh, so they sat there and just went on and on, and you know we discussed it. Uh, they were. My mother keeps uh, very meticulous records. So there's, you know, there's a there's a photo file with a title, you know, Uncle So and So, all the relatives buried alive, 1943. You know, so everything is very meticulously documented on her end. Well, it's, it's funny, um, you're still there, aren't you? Yes. Okay, because this little box they have here for $49 is all wired together, and once I touch it, it goes off. Um, it, what was really interesting is that, like your great-grandfather, I think, my grandfather was from Vitebsk and grew, oh, up, really? yeah. and grew up with Mark Chagall and left because of the pogroms oh, wow. in 1904, right. also right. the home of uh, Emanuel Velikovsky, the guy who wrote Worlds okay. in Collision. Okay. So that that painting, "I in the Village," you know, by mm -hmm. by Mark Chagall, that's always been behind my desk uh, because that's the street on which my grandfather grew up. Yeah, I mean that was one of the sort of gigantic, uh, you know, uh, gathering spots of of some of the best Jews around. I think that and Vilnius, Lithuania, and uh, and those were amazing sort of centers of Jewish life and Jewish art. Yeah, it's like what they did in Idiot. Nazis did in World War II. They sent out the smartest people so that those people could come up with things that could beat them. It's like uh, the Pale of Settlement in Belarus is just, you know, like you said. And I always wanted to go back to Belarus, but like you said in the book, it's a really nasty dictatorship, and I'm afraid to go there. No, it's fine to go there. You'll be absolutely safe. It's a, it's a very well-run dictatorship for the post-Soviet Union, actually. The, the trains sort of run on time. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, I think under Stalin and, 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 and other, the Soviet Union has always destroyed its best citizens. It's always taken the smartest people and crushed them. And the fact that, you know, the Soviet Jews, who were very well educated, but so many of them left in 1979 and after is, is a huge loss for, for Russia and for the other republics. Oh, explain about the, the grain Jews, because a lot of people don't know, understand that. Well, in 1979, uh, Jimmy Carter and... Um, Brezhnev came to an agreement, you know, uh, Russia had a bad, the Soviet Union had a bad grain harvest, and so Russia needs grain to run, and America needs Jews to run, so they exchanged grain for Jews. Uh, so I was exchanged for about uh, 300 loaves of bread and a croissant, you know. I'm not sure who got the better, better side of the deal on that one. Seems like pretty equal to me. Um, pretty equal, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, also, your video of introducing a toilet, um, that was hilarious, and it also... As another kind of factor that we share a couple of things is that my brother Bob, he bought Toto toilets for everyone in my nuclear family. That's what he got my nephew for his bar mitzvah. A Toto. He got what? What's the? The Toto. Remember the Toto, the one you like, the toilet. The toilet. I love the Toto. Yes, it's a, it's so hygienic. It's just amazing. I mean. I would love to just make an office out of my Toto toilet. My brother tried to get the national, the United States rights for Toto toilets. 
Uh-huh. But he gives them away as present. He, I wouldn't take one because I prefer my bidet, but I don't need to go into the details about how I use it. I love bidets, but I think the photo toilet is an important advance in toilet technology. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's incredible. And you see them everywhere now. Yes. Wonderful. Well, so, you know, also, um, to use a word that I guess I hate is how, your asthma. How did that inform... That's the word I hate. How does that inform your, your life? And uh, because it's seen, you bring it up so often, and then the, the miracle of going to the West and getting this steroid that allows you to yeah. breathe and live. Yeah, asthma was an incredible part of my life, and it was huge. And uh, I think it helped me to become a writer because I wasn't out there playing with the uh, you know the soccer ball with all the other kids. I was at home reading and reading, and then also writing. When my grandmother first asked me to write a book, I was five years old. She asked me to write a novel and. When you're asthmatic, what are you going to do? You're just going to wheeze and write, wheeze and write. And so I think that that's uh, an important part of uh, growing up. Uh, and uh, hey, I'm not comparing myself to Marcel Proust, but he had huge asthma. So if you want to, a child to become a, a writer, and I don't know who wants that to happen, but you know, I would deprive him or her of oxygen if you can. Yeah, but I would prefer eating Madeleine's to farmer's cheese. Oh, good Lord. Well, growing up in France and growing up in Leningrad are two <laughs> very different things. <laughs> Do you know uh, when you did that uh, Madonna thing that you wrote down instead of like a virgin, like a sturgeon? Mm-hmm. Do you know she suggested to Weird Al that he do that? Really? Yeah, he never did, but, but she. He ha- no, he. Did. You know what he did? I think if I, I could be correct. Like a surgeon, like a surgeon, like a surgeon. Right. Right. Exactly. That's what he did. Okay, so you're right about that. But I think like a sturgeon would have been funnier if he dressed up like a big fish and. It could have been that whole kind of splash. Remember the movie Splash with Daryl Hannah? Yeah, that eating the lobster. That as well. Yeah. So. I'm just suggesting things now. Yeah. I don't know. I ate caviar last night. You did. You're. <laughs> you guys live pretty large in Philadelphia mm. metro area. Nah, my brother gave it away to some of our tenants, and there was a couple left over, so I went to the refrigerator and stole it. Mm. Okay, that that makes it more humane. Yeah. Right? So, uh, the other another thing um, that. Um, ties us closely together and, and um, well not closely but it, it, you talk about this woman who goes to Gainesville where I lived for 29 years 5 months and 10 days wow. and and um, she goes to Market Street Pub which is where I hung out a lot and she hammers this guy over the head <laughs> yes one of my uh, ex-girlfriends became uh, a con a convict uh, I want to fish you the sense would be one of my ex girlfriends became an ex con, but I think she's still a con because she's on probation for 14 years after it happened. So she's she's almost out of the woods. Uh, so yeah, I, I really knew how to pick them. You know, I love women who would attack their boyfriends with hammers. Like that. Well, she wrapped it up. I'm sorry. Uh, didn't she wrap it first so it wouldn't be? She wrapped. Uh, she wrapped the handle in plastic. Oh, with the oh. Cord so <laughs> that she wouldn't get the fingerprints on, but. I missed that. I thought that, only made it, that only made it more premeditated. <laughs> yeah, attempted murder. Actually, if you look at um, Market Street Pub, there were a lot of real murders, so she didn't really succeed. Well, I'd hate to think she failed at that, but I guess she did. Well, so, um, you know, you're a Democrat. You were a staunch Republican as you grew up because you came from the Soviet Union, and mm-hmm. you, you know, you, you liked Ronald Reagan, and you, you thought he was, you know, great as opposed to Michael mm. Dukakis sticking his head out of the tank. Right. So, you know, you, you do. You, what did your parents think when they read this, or have they read it? I don't think they've read it yet, but I sent it to them. Their English is not the best in the world, so hopefully I think they wouldn't get the nuances of it until uh, it came out in Russian. If it comes out in Russian at all, but if it comes out in Russian and they read that stuff, geez. Did, well, I think it's a very loving portrait in a way. It's, it's very. Cool. Well, other than the fact that he punches you in the nose and then boxes you about the ears. But that, in Russia, that's, you know, par for the course. I mean, how else are you going to raise a kid without just constantly wailing on him? My mother, I was sitting with her last week and having lunch, and she turned to me and casually said, I wonder why you never did anything with your life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a good question. I wonder, you know, it's like that moment in your book where you go, I don't care, because it just... Start, now it's off my water like a duck off a duck's back you know it's like yeah but then I went well, she told me to take some trash out and I go out yeah. to the closet where the trash cans are and I see yeah. that the top is off so I stand there and I'm going I wonder if I should put the top back on or if she likes it off 
So mm. I put it back on. Then I go home and I get a phone call. What's wrong with you? Why would you put the top back on? You never do anything right. Why don't you think before you act? Something horrible is going to happen to you. Uh, well, it sounds like another healthy relationship. Um, you guys should go on a cruise together. That's my advice. I have. Never again. Oh. We went on okay. a, fall, a fall foliage cruise up to, to Nova Scotia. Oh, my goodness, that's very romantic. We went out to eat, <laughs> we went out to eat and she says, I have to go back to the ship because I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so she walked all the way. <laughs> yeah. It was a nice restaurant. <laughs> yeah, good times. Well, I think you're, you, you should start with your memoir, too. I mean, I, when I was reading yours, I figured, like, yeah, well, my grandmother would take my cheek and pinch it really hard and say, Shane and Punham. Yeah, yeah. Shane and Punham. Right. Like that. Yeah. Some of it is cute. You know, Shane put on with a tiny bit of violence and squeezing of the cheek, but you know, overall pretty good. Well, my problem was my grandfather who, who emigrated was Samuel Hankin. He was like a mythical hero. So I'm Samuel Hankin because I was the first born after he died. Uh -huh. And then the Shane and Punham, everybody thought I was like him. And so they gave me these incredibly high expectations mm -hmm. of whom I was supposed to be when I grew up. And I never did that. Oh. So now I'm a miserable failure. Oh, but I'm not little. No, yeah, that's that's really important. You know, for me, being a failure and being of small stature combined was a real disaster. I mean, if I was a tall failure, this would be looking up, so to speak. Yeah, being tall really makes a difference. You know, it really makes a difference. You know? But it seems like when you got to college, when you got to uh, Oberlin, it seemed like you were really coming out. It, if reading between the lines, it was like not that you were the class clown, but you were almost mm -hmm. like. All, you know, like two standard deviations off. Right. No, Oberlin allows all the great losers of the world to shine. I mean, that's what the college was there for. It doesn't matter what a mess you are. And, you know, and I was a drunken stone monstrosity named Gary Gary was my nickname. But even then, I was pretty popular, you know. So uh, at Oberlin, anything goes. And anyone goes. Hey, did you call that one girl Rif Rifka because of Rifka Galchen? No. This is just a Jewish name that I like. I know, but Rifka Galchin is a great author and that atmospheric disturbance. Oh, yeah. No, I love Rifka Galchin. But, uh, and she's really pretty. She is pretty. I just don't disagree. Good uh, hair. hair. Yeah, she does. And great pictures on her book jacket, unlike you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, yeah, because you don't have great hair. <laughs> I don't have hair. You know, well, that's yeah, not true. You keep saying that, and then I keep expecting your hairline to. And you look better. You look better. You make yourself look like a shmuel in that, uh, in that video. You don't look that bad. Well, there was a lot of makeup and artistry and stuff like that. Yeah. It, it's all you know, CGI that makes me look like that. I know this is so funny. Why is he going with that dork? <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Also, there was a moment in the book where you said you weren't going to, for the sake of brevity, you weren't going to use sick anymore. Right. You did after that. Oh, sick. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Only one but time. Hey, thank you. I'll, you know, just send a letter to the editor, I guess. We'll, we'll fix it in the next edition. Um, the other thing is that uh, my brother's like an ultimate Frisbee champion and goes all around the world playing ultimate Frisbee, mm -hmm. which is what you did the first day at... Um, I guess yes, it, I played ultimate frisbee for about two hours of my life, so that was the most sports I ever did. Yeah. And that's where uh, my brothers and I play at, at the Meadow in, in Central Park. Oh. Isn't that oh. fun? I mean, this stuff. I'm sunbathing there to say hi to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, well, to me, it seems you know like all these coincidences are kind of cool, but I guess it doesn't probably to you. It's interesting. I mean, people have been coming up to me during these readings and saying, you know, I've had exactly the same life you did, and. Uh, and then I look into their eyes, and, and they're me, you know. They, they look just like me. They talk like me. Uh, exactly same sweater. It's really eerie. Yeah. It's not that with me, though. It's just like the Vitebsk thing. That was, to me, very interesting, mm -hmm. th and that yeah. kind of thing. And then, like, um, you bring up the book Call It Sleep, which no one talks about Call It Sleep anymore. That was my favorite book, one of my favorite yeah. books. Yeah. Well, I teach at Columbia uh, in my Immigrant at Go-Go seminar. So. Uh, yeah, he wrote a it's like a semi-sequel when he was like 60-some years old called uh, Mercy okay. of a Rude Stream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which he, it was like he was really trying hard but couldn't quite do it again. Hey, if I'm writing anything in my 60s, that'll be a miracle. If I'm alive in my 60s, that'll be a miracle. I'm 61, Gary. 
You are? Oh yeah. my god. Well, but you're 61 in American years, so. That's true. When in Russian years, is more like 93. Right? right. It's the new 40, so I'm actually younger than you. you are, you're younger than me. You're, yeah. And then, like you were talking about speak memory, um, yeah. and, and the Bakov, and then I yeah. turn to the woman who works in my bookstore, and I see tattooed on her arm is speak memory. This is more like shush memory, or <laughs> Arbalan memory. Well, do you look back on all this, like when you were beaten up and you were the second most despised person in your class? Do these memories, do they, it, it makes, you make it sound as if a lot of the stuff that seems horrible was kind of pleasant for you. Yeah, look, I mean, childhood is childhood. What kid doesn't get wailed on and picked on and stuff like that? That's just a part of growing up. So mine was just a little bit different because the, 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 the conflict being, from, you know, the, the enemy, the superpower enemy of the Soviet Union during Reagan's evil empire speech. I remember I had to pretend to the kids in school that I was actually born in East Berlin and not in Leningrad. And <laughs> I was trying to convince Jewish kids that you're a German, that you know, things aren't going well. Yeah, that was, yeah. that was not really that smart. But <laughs> yeah, not so smart. But anyway, what I'm saying is everyone has a... If anyone had a wonderful upbringing in, in, in their elementary school, then they're probably... I don't know, on some nth level of enlightenment by now, because that's, that's pretty hard to do. Well, that was like, my situation was like yours also, in that uh, for some stupid reason they skipped a grade for me, so I was younger than everybody. I see. So in seventh grade, when everyone was having, you know, their bar, bar mitzvahs, I was 11 years old. Mm. And so the, the possibility of me being with a girl on, in any kind of way was negligible, if that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that does make a difference when you're younger, I think. And you, I was actually, I think, left back. So I, I was, uh, and studies show. Oh, you were older, right? I was older, and studies show that when you're older, you're actually you can fit in better, which wasn't the case with me. But you know, if you're, I mean, in Oberlin, usually most students take about eleven or twelve years to graduate. So <laughs> some of them are real wise men and women. You know, I almost went there for that very reason. Yeah. And look, uh, what happened to me was. My father, I wanted to be a writer. My father wanted me to be a lawyer. I did the opposite. I became a lawyer. And oh, Jesus Christ. I know. Yeah, still am a lawyer. A you are? Oh. Well. Uh, can you help me with some lawsuits? <laughs> I'm only licensed to practice in Pennsylvania and Florida. Oh, uh, okay. So try and do, some, do something there and I can help you. Okay. I'll try <laughs> to get sued in Florida for once. <laughs> Where, are you being sued? <laughs> Where are you being sued now? Uh, mostly on the Cayman Islands. It's complicated. Well, you should never have opened that uh, offshore account. I know, I know. Now that you're a gazillionaire. Yeah, right. <laughs> ka -ching. Well, it's going to be a movie, you know. Who's that? Who are they going to get to play you, though? Uh, well, Tom Hanks will play me right now, and uh, Justin Bieber will play the younger me. So it's, you know. Are you a believer? <laughs> oh, am I a believer? Uh, for sure, yeah. I can't I believe that they're, they're charging with felony for throwing eggs on a house. That's, I know, it's ridiculous. It, you know, he's, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Let him grow up, you know. Yeah, he can't help being what he is right now. <laughs> but then again, you have role models like Taylor Swift and Jennifer Lawrence who actually are decent people and okay. laugh at themselves and laugh at their fame. Yes. But um, I was going to ask you know, something good, too. Mm. I can't remember. What was it? Mm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so have you been on Howard Stern yet? You'd be great on Howard Stern. No, no, he never he doesn't know who I am. This is, I, you know. Oh, the only people who know me are the you know three hundred thousand literary nerds that live in Portland, Oregon, and Brooklyn, and maybe parts of Philly, and then that's it. You know. All right, have you spoken to Powell's bookstore yet? Um, tomorrow. <laughs> are you serious? Yep. Really? Well, that was of course. Well, that was well, a good every get. bookstore has Powell's. So, I mean, come on. Yeah. Hey, so how are you doing with that Google Glass thing? Well, I haven't worn it since I got it, except for that, you know, couple of weeks when I had to write the article. It, it, it makes me a little googly-eyed. It's not, it's not good for me. I already have enough problems. Yeah, I know, and it's kind of like, you know, you you end up with these kind of like reflex movements that people think there's something wrong with you, and, and there is something wrong with me. I know. Hey, Google just came up with a contact lens that apparently will monitor your blood sugar in the event you have diabetes, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. And, works for me. And then they bought that Nest thermostat the other day, too, for $3 billion. Uh-huh. So what are you going to do next? What What are you writing now? Uh, well, this tour is going to take up about 130 days of my life, so 
I had nothing, you know. I'm just trying to survive. Um, and then, I don't know, I'll write something else, something without maybe a Russian Jewish Nebish narrator. Um, I'm not sure what that would be, but... I know, that's what I... I asked Laura that, and she said she... Laura says that all she does, the only thing she does in English is write everything else, mm -hmm. and interviews, everything else is in Russian. Wow. Why does she do that? She lives in New York. I don't know. Yeah. And she, unlike you, who practiced in front of a mirror and watch TV, she sp still speaks with a very, very heavy Russian accent. Yeah, but it's cute. It's cute. I wish oh, she it, still had that Russian accent. Yeah. yeah. She, it, it is very cute. I don't know if it would be mm. with you. Mm. But, um, yeah, you practice assiduously to make sure you didn't have one, right? Yeah, I didn't want to have a Russian. I mean, come on, I was already <laughs> a red gerbil in high school, in uh, elementary school. I didn't, want, I didn't want any more suffering. Oh, tell tell us about your nickname and how that came about and how it really actually. Well, I, I made that nickname up. It wasn't really. Uh, people just called me Kami, you know. <laughs> red. But there were all those movies: Red Dawn, Red Turbo, Red Hamster. That you know, <laughs> kind, of, kind of rubbed off all that rodentry, all that crimson rodentry. Oh yeah, Red October. Yeah, you're right. When I read that, October, I didn't think about it. A lot of red. Yeah, Reds. That was with Warren Beatty a long time ago. I saw that. That was a very long movie. Yes, it was. Wow. But it was better than the whatever he did the road with the, uh, Dustin Hoffman, the road to somewhere. Ishtar. Yeah. But now yeah. it's become a cult favorite now, although I never did see it. it. Yeah, yeah. People get high and they watch it. <laughs> That's another thing you talk about, which we do share, is um, um, the idea of mind-altering using certain substances and stuff like that in Oberlin. It seemed like that was most of your credits were derived from that yeah no but in Oberlin you know, it's, uh, that school is not uh, it's not immune to drug use uh, there, there is some drug use within its borders um, so yeah I took a class in the Beatles that was taught by one of the students and we would take acid and just chill out and... yeah it was uh, Revolver what was the song I forget. yes the uh, yeah, my bird can sing and tomorrow never knows. I think tomorrow never knows. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm I'm proud of my education. You know, a good use of a hundred thousand dollars for my parents. They were really nice to you in a lot of different ways. I mean, your mom taking you shopping before you went to college. And then... Yeah, that was very sweet. Yeah, we you know we sat there. <laughs> very clear that my lack of success in Hebrew school was partly based on my lack of genera and union based shirts. So we <laughs> tried to remedy that with the last of our money, and uh, and that helped. Oh, t uh, tell us about that shirt, the first shirt you wore to Oberlin and what it had on it. That was funny. Which one? The shirt you, your mom bought you. Um, it wasn't like an OP shirt, but it was one with Marilyn on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was even an OP shirt, uh, Ocean Pacific. Yeah, it had a big uh, big tie-dye picture of Marilyn Monroe, and I went to Oberlin with that T-shirt thinking people were going to find that interesting or funny, but... It was the Kurt Cobain era. Everybody wore flannels except for me with my stupid T-shirt. Oh, God. All of life is just dressing correctly. If you can get that right, the rest will just fall into place. Well, you moved to flannel. You might have been a year too late, but you did move to it. I did move to it, yes, of course. I am a follower. Well, you know, it's the other thing I was, gonna think, was thinking about in terms of the loving nature of the book is that the relationship you had with the woman you met there, and, right. and the, it was really nice the way she said I love you and then you repeated it in the book you know mm -hmm. yeah that was the first girlfriend I had in, in, in Oberlin well in life in general but what I you know what, what really moved me about that relationship was the um, fact that you know I, I constantly had a persona kind of humorous persona that was not true to life but in her I found my first confidant and I was able to tell her the innermost things about my life that I hadn't shared with anyone, that I even hadn't shared with myself, you know, so, and that began began a pattern of, of really of my confiding in women in a way that after I graduated from college, almost all my best friends were women, because I just felt that there was an ability to talk honestly with them that I didn't have with my male friends. Yeah, I feel the same way. And they say the same thing to me that she said to you, which is, you know, it's kind of like you try too hard, you know, you, right. over, you overdo it, you yeah. know, and that's something that, you know, it's, and like, like you and your psychiatrist, I mean, it's like, yeah, you figure out what happened at the church, what happened back then, you know, and there is something, it doesn't really make much difference if you figure out what it was, but it's always way, way, way back there. It's way, way back there. 
Do you know what it because is? We, we, we don't want to be the people we are, so we create myths for ourselves of who we are. And the memoir, if I see it, if it's practiced correctly, is a way to shatter those myths. Do you think you do that in your memoir? Hell, I try. I don't know. I do, I do the best I can, given where I am in my life. But it's up for every reader to decide. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's really honest. I mean, unless you're lying. I mean, it's really open and honest, especially about your family and especially about your own, like that relationship with John, whoever, whatever his real name is. Right. You treated him like crap. Yeah. No, I was not a. There's no. There are no heroes in anything I write in my novels or in my or in this memoir. I, I wasn't a great person. I, I had the same feeling of needing to treat others the way I've been treated before. I mean, that's just the way the world works. And I mistreated some of the people that meant me the best. And that's that's how it is. So I, I wasn't going to skimp on that in writing the memoir. And just I was. I was a descendant of a long line of a very difficult history, and um, you know, that came out in, in very unattractive ways. Yeah, but what's good? The good thing about it is you don't do like a lot of people do, and blame you know, blame your behavior on that. You know, you, no. you know, it's it's like okay, and and there is a moment. There's a moment in the book where you kind of okay, get over it, and you do. It seems yeah. like right. Yeah. No, I do. I do. I mean. I, you got to move on somehow. Uh, I don't see writing a memoir as any kind of catharsis, or you know, it's not closure or any of these other words. It's just uh, as honestly, as journalistically as possible, you set out your life, and then you go on to the next. One. Well, the reason I think I can tell it's honest is because you aren't as funny as you sometimes are. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I mean, you can't just use humor here because. Uh, I mean, I try to deploy as much humor as possible right. in the situations, but in the end, there's something deeply not funny about a lot of it. Well, a lot of the reviews have said, you know, like at the very end, when you're back in Russia with your parents and you're walking around reliving a lot of your youth and your father is not the big, you know, you and your father are the same now. He's not the big, big person. And mm -hmm. he realizes that you realize that you're not the little son, you're just the son. And right. uh you know, it's, you know, and what am I reading a book by you and almost crying for? It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's really, really ridiculous. Yeah, I'm I sorry. mean, crying with laughter is okay, but actually crying from a book no. by Gary, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, if you cry from a Steingart book, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to cry myself. <laughs> it's embarrassing. But look, so it's like my well, memoir. I'm opening myself well, up to you. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Maybe I could do that. Maybe I can be the memoir whisperer, you know. Well, I think, you know, for people like me who have a similar ancestry and have, you know, like I was telling you about my mom and my dad was even worse. When, when, when will you ever make me proud of you? That was, <laughs> that was a good one. That is a good one. That was, that was a knife and that stuck with me for a long time. Probably still does. Sure. It never really goes away. I mean, one is always a little failure at, at some level, even though. No, tell you otherwise. he'll be dead. He, he, it'll be 20 years on April 15th, tax day. He signed all his tax returns. He stood up and said he felt dizzy and died. Oh, wow. Too bad. It was in between Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Hmm. On wow. Friday. Yeah. Uh, well, and on that note, RIP the professor on Gilligan's Island. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he's the last. No, no, Mary Ellen's still alive. Yeah. He well, yeah. Nine, he lived a full life. I mean, I'm... I'm Hey, yeah, so you uh, in the old uh, Marianne, not Mary Ellen. So in the old Ginger Marianne, you were obviously Marianne. You couldn't understand why Ginger was even, you know, right? No, I think on, on Three's Company, I always liked the brunette more than the blonde. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Well, what's, what about Ginger Marianne? I think I like Marianne more. Yeah. I think she's cuter. Yeah. I mean, no offense to Ginger. I mean, she's hot, but Marianne is cute in the way I like. Well, it's the girl next door kind of look, which from your pictures, it seems very similar you know what I mean yeah I do look like the girl next door too so it's well at least to James Franco you do yeah <laughs> that's true that look you give him when <laughs> that loving look you give him is really good <laughs> yeah I'm pretty good at that yeah. I know maybe you should just be a switch hitter or something that's what I thought was gonna happen with you and John tell you the truth yeah it felt huh. like it felt like it was going there yeah uh -huh. And, well, that actually was going there with your boss who took you to Florida. 
<laughs> There's a lot of implied homosexuality in this book that never really leads anywhere. It's too bad. <laughs> I know. I know. It's just, yeah. Yeah, well, you could I be lying. I wish things had been gayer, but, but they weren't. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with that. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> God, I mean, I just wish it was gayer. <laughs> oh, my next book will be more. Yeah. Yeah, you can start thinking about that. Well, the other thing is, you're kind of lying because in your book you say you have to write. You get up and you, you have to write. So you must be writing because you're, you said you have to write. You can't stop. I'm writing little articles for, you know, that will help with publicity. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> once the publicity machine kicks in, you will, you, will, you will be a slave for a while. It must be exhausting. It is well, you know. I'm 41, and when I when I did my first tour, I think I was like 29 or 30, and I was full of energy. You should have seen me. Oh my god! I mean, I would you know land in a city like Dayton, Ohio, and be like, oh my god, I can't wait to find out more about you know the Wright brothers. And now I'm 41, and you know you you travel from city to city every day, and it's just oh my god! It's, 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 thank God I have all my Lipitor in order, you know. Well, you're going to be in Philadelphia at the Free Library. In fact, this will be. I'm broadcasting this. This will be broad. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that because people think it's live. I'm broadcasting this on the 20th, and you'll be at the library the 21st. Oh wow! Well, I love that library. I, I, I had a great reading there. There, and I love Philadelphia. It's it's just great. It's, I can't wait to go there. It's so close to New York too. I mean, yeah, you can get on. You can get on 30th Street. Excella. Yeah, you can be. Yeah, the Excel, and you'll be there in one hour. Exactly. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, if somebody. Oh, I'd love to live in Rittenhouse Square or something. Have a nice. Nice little townhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where my brother had for a long time. And then there's this really beautiful building called the Murano at 21st and Market. So you could actually, there's a lot of people who live in New York and work in New York. No, who work yeah. in New York and they live in Philadelphia and just go on to get on the train in the morning. Yeah. It's easier yeah, yeah. It's easier than you coming from Long Island. That's true. And that's less true. time. And half the money also. It's not less. Yeah, it's amazing. Awesome. No, it's a great, great town. And I love that free library. What a nice Nice venue. Well, it's because of killed. yeah, it's because of Benjamin yeah. Franklin. We I, I used, love that Franklin guy. <laughs> guy. Um, my brother and I used to take the train down. My mother would let us take the train down when I was eight and he was six, from uh -huh. out in the out in the suburbs downtown, and we would walk up to the Free Library, spend all day there. It was wonderful. And then there was this old bookstore called Leary's, and mm. they wrapped their books in brown paper and string, which I still do at my bookstore because I think that's the way you should sell them. I think you're right. And um, each floor was a different genre. And like you, I went to the floor that was science fiction. So, ah, very good. So it was always Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Robert Highland, Theodore Sturgeon, speaking of Sturgeon mm -hmm. again. And, um, and then here's like my father, like your father. I'd have like 13 paperback books like stacked up between my hands going up my chest and I'd be going, <laughs> and I'd be going oh God, he's, he's going to get so mad at me for wanting all these books. And... Mm -hmm. um, and then I brought him to him, and he goes, oh, as long as you read them. Huh, huh. Well, that's sweet. See, there's something good there. Very nice. Yeah, it was. Um, it's like those moments Speaking of had. science fiction, somebody in Seattle bought me uh, their uh, asthma inhaler to sign. That was very cool. Really? Yeah. Yeah, science fiction is like, there's this, you know what, you know what's really, what do you think of this? I mean, I have a rare book collection, and I sell rare books on the internet and all that, mm -hmm. but, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with it, like, um, do you, I mean, you, you kind of think, well, you know, read a book, you're done, give it to somebody else or whatever. Yeah. What's the point of having a rare book is to me, it's like you have the author in your hand, like you really hold his soul in your hand, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I do have a love hate relationship with it. Yeah. 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 Well, as long as I, I, I like reading books in paper, I think that's a verb. That's still the technology I prefer. You know, it's, it feels nice. Well, doing this interview show and having to, you know, I'm up to like 140 authors, I have to use, you know, my iPad because, you know, like, and it's great because I can take notes on the questions I want to ask you, none of which I've yeah. asked, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's lovely. Thank you for reading. Oh, God. Thank you for reading. Yeah. I want to hug and kiss every reader I have on the mouth. I, uh, open tongue? Like open mouth? No, no, just on the lips, you know, just. Like a like like a nice Russian a Russian kiss. Yeah, well, that's on the cheek three times. I could do that too. I mean, whatever. Uh, in Philadelphia, I, I want to hug people a lot. Yeah, but what about the furriness? Um, 
Okay. I'm okay with it. I'm her suit. You're her suit. <laughs> it works out. It's fine. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> On that note, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I, I I could ask you other stuff, but that was you know okay. <laughs> You're her suit. I'm her suit. <laughs> That's our musical. <laughs> yeah, suit and two pair of pants. Her suit and two pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. It's nice thank talking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hope you come to the free library. It'd be nice to see you. I will. I'll come and bother you. I'll he I'll heckle cool. you. Oh, great. That's what I need. Thank okay. You. And that's what I'll do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So long. Okay. That was Gary Steingart author of Little Failure, which is a hilarious book basically about me um, or any other um, Russian Jew who came over here and, uh, and had to live with uh, interesting parents who uh, treated them both very well and sometimes um, in ways that uh, could change their lives forever. So in any event, he was he's a great guy, lots of reviews out. Um, the book is being touted by everyone. There's an article in The Week magazine. There's an article in the New York Times Sunday Review. So it was a pleasure talking to him. Now next week, if everything goes right, we'll have a real coup. Oh, and uh, uh, like I said, Gary's going to be at uh, the Free Library on the 21st. Then after that, we have a real coup, if I can get them, which would be Ransom Riggs, who wrote Miss Peregrine's School for Peculiar Children, difficult to say, and whose new book, Hollow City, is the second of what now be a trilogy. The first book is being made into a movie by Tim Burton, and as I said, knowing Tim Burton, it's quite logical given the way she looks that Helen Bonham Carter will probably be starring in some part of it since she's very peculiar looking, and perhaps Johnny Depp, who can do almost anything. So uh, Ransom Riggs will get, hopefully, and he's going to appear, I think, on the 27th at the library as well. And then if we are really lucky, we'll get Sue Monk Kidd. And I very seldom do two at one time, but um, if we get Sue Monk Kidd, who wrote The Secret Life of Bees, which was a great book and also a great movie, and now she has a new book. It takes her about 10 years to write a book, and uh, this one is incredible. It's called The Invention of Wings. And if we can get both of them, like I said, it'll be one show that's uh, packed with a lot of people. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, I'm always happy with the authors we have. But for the last month or so and the next month coming up, last week you heard Elizabeth Strout, um, who was the editor of Best American Short Stories. Um, you'll hear um, uh, Gary Steingart and um, author of Little Failure. You'll be hearing... Uh, Ransom Riggs on Hollow City. You'll be hearing Sue Monk Kidd on The Invention of Wings. You'll be hearing Cheryl Tippins, who wrote Inside the Dream Palace, which is a long book about um, Chelsea Hotel and the people who frequented back in the 60s and the 70s. It's a great book. Also, you'll be hearing Helene Wicker, author of um, The Gollum and the Ginny. And um, we will also be listening to Laura Vaspnyar, who wrote The Scent of Pine. And a rebroadcast of uh, Rachel Kushner's book, Flamethrowers, which is now out in paperback. So I'm really impressed by the quality of these people and the fact that they're willing to come and talk to me. So in any event, I look forward to next week, and I look forward to having you here with me. Thanks a lot for uh, listening to The Avid Reader. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today. 